it's not fun to should on yourself and, but it's also not fun for someone to should at you. So to be like, this is the way it is. This is what you should be. No, you shouldn't say should even, but like to look at your language when you're talking it to other people. But it's also a lot of the book too, is having self-compassion for yourself. And like, this stuff is not your fault. The fact that you're shooting on yourself, the doubts, the fears, the shame, the guilt, this is all part of us as humans experience. So to allow yourself to look at it with more love and compassion and not, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm still struggling with this. Or I can't believe I just had that judgment. So I, I think we end up, you know, piling these heavy emotions on top of heavy emotions already. And we don't end up healing it because we're making ourselves wrong for even feeling the way we do. How can people stop shooting all over themselves <laughs> and, 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 and unshoot themselves? Well, what are some of the, obviously reading your book would be one way to start, but let's say you, you, it's deeper. Like you say, it's deeper than that. Do they need to enroll in therapy? And if so, what kind of therapy or what are some of the other modalities for, for, for unshooting? Yeah. Well, I mean, so I, of course, give the first tip of attempting what I did and to actually pay attention to that word when it's coming at you, but especially in your own language. And then you'll be able to look at it more in your own thoughts and like, where is this coming from? Um, like, again, that's what gives me this constant awareness every day when I am like, wow, I'm still beating myself up about that. And then, but I have that moment of, I don't want to believe that and giving myself the choice of that. So I, I really recommend paying attention to the actual word of, yeah, I think for sure therapy. Another thing that's really helped me, like I said, um, I've been really aware of how I feel in my body. And I thought that that was sort of always a bonus of having fibromyalgia was like that it, it made, and that I chose life. So I was paying attention to how I felt around people and situations and stuff, because I wanted to be able to have enough energy to live my life. So I've realized that not as many people are as able to tune into their feelings. And what I was able, like a lot of the uncovering of the stuff that goes into these books about, you know, not enoughness and doubts and shame and all it was setting boundaries, even that I was able to tune more into that from paying attention to how I feel. So the shoulds help with that. But one thing that I have always given um, like clients and stuff is to start just even a practice, like maybe it's, you know, even put it in your alarm or like every day, like when you go to the bathroom, it's like, you know, find a way to make it be part of your thing to just check in with how, what am I feeling? What am I feeling? Because for me, that's how I am able to notice a should that I haven't actually said or heard. I can just notice like, huh, there's an energy in my body. Like I feel anxious. I feel worried. I feel concerned. Like I can just tell when I'm not like fully present or like, I'm not like as easily accessible to joy and stuff. Like I feel this heaviness. And so just being able to notice like, oh, there's a heaviness here. So, and then I will be able to ask questions like, oh, what's going on here? And I can track it back to, oh, I sent so-and-so a text message and they didn't reply. So I made up that, you know, they don't care about me or something. So I can look at, I can notice my heaviness of feelings and then look at, oh, I'm anxious about this. Oh, I'm upset about this. Oh, I'm that. So like if for people that aren't able to do that, to just like set times of day that you check in with, what am I feeling? And then you naming what you're feeling has been such a powerful thing for me. I'm able to easily track it back most of the times, but you don't even have to know why am I feeling this, but just even looking at, oh, what am I feeling? I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling worried. I'm feeling concerned. Because a lot of what my book is, is uncovering our thoughts and feelings so that we can move through them. We're usually just so busy in our life that we're go, 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 or I don't want to face that. Okay, I'm worried or I'm scared or I'm nervous or this, but let me just keep going. And another thing that really helped me to name my feelings was journaling. And I bring that up in the book, like the morning pages style of journaling. I don't follow it like actually like, oh, you have to do it first thing in the morning, like Julia Cameron says, but that freestyle of writing, the just brain dump where it's just, you know, you just keep writing. There's no new paragraphs. It doesn't have to be pretty. You're just like, oh, I don't know what's going on today. I'm really worried about so-and-so I'm this. When I first started doing that, 
I would get stopped when the worry or a fear or a doubt, anything that I used to want to label negative, I now don't label, try to label those feelings as negative, but the uncomfortable feelings, I was like, oh, I can't write this down. If I write this down, that means it's real. Like, you know, it was again, this like, no, I can only be positive or let me write the things. Like it was easy for me to share dreams and wants or just like, you know, oh, I forgot I have to do this today or that, like, but just not exciting, like blah, 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 that would come out. But when the real stuff would come out, I would try to hide from it. I can't write this down because that'll make it real. But what I realized was it's already real. And by me facing it, by giving it attention, that doesn't make it like give it more power. It actually takes the power away. So that's what, again, like all the shoulds and looking at your feelings and the journaling is to uncover what it is that you're telling yourself, what it is that you're feeling. We try to just push it down and keep going. But where I find true freedom, alignment, connection to myself and my life is by facing that stuff and then seeing, I don't have to see if this is the truth. I can question it. I can ask myself, what I want to believe? Or also just even nurturing myself while I'm in them. So naming your thoughts, the ones you don't want to have also, naming the worries, the fears, the shame, the guilt, the blame, all of that is actually for me, the most healing thing that has given me the power to continue to show up for my life and do what I want to do. So I would love to, I don't know if this is something you do or you encourage doing, um, <laughs> but it's, it feels uh, for my man, man brain, it feels a bit abstract and I would love to make it a little more practical. And I was wondering if you'd be open to like workshopping. I was, I, I have some should statements and I would love okay. to say them just to hear how you would reframe them to kind of yeah. make them make more, give the result, the desired result that you, that you're talking about. Is that cool? Yeah. I'd love so we that. can, so the, so listener, we can talk through like how you think about it. Okay. I shouldn't eat this slice of cake. Um, so I'm thinking to myself, I shouldn't eat this slice of cake. What, how should I be reframing that? So, yeah, I feel like I shouldn't eat this slice of cake. Then it would be first a question like, well, why do I think I shouldn't eat this cake? Because it's going to um, cause me to have a, the waste handles. So, and then, but like really feeling like, is it, if you're telling yourself I shouldn't, then it's likely because you actually want to, but you're telling like, I, I right. shouldn't. I want it. So for me, it's looking at again, like, okay, well, why do I not want to eat this? Okay. Cause that's going to be, yeah, it's going to give me these waste handles. So that could be, okay. Then that is your answer. I also am like for some, it's not like all the time, but when you do really want something and you're trying to like convince yourself not to, but a lot of times too, if you went through that, like I shouldn't have this, but I want it anyway, then sometimes I feel like we eat it and you're just like, I'll show you self. And then afterwards feel like this like guilt, right? And a regret. But when you're confronting yourself, like, yeah, I know I shouldn't eat this. I don't think I should eat this because it's going to like give me these whatever waste handles. <laughs> but I really do want this. Like looking at, do I want this? Do, am I making that choice? So again, seeing that you are making that choice that I do want to eat this cake and I know that it might give me these waste handles. And so that's the choice. And that might even look at, okay, so maybe I just eat half the cake. But like, if you are actually choosing the cake, then allow yourself to have it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Where I think the, the more is that, if you're constantly leaving, I shouldn't do these things, but you actually want them. Like, well, what is the bigger priority to you? If you really are, this is the highest priority above all in my life is what my body looks like and not like my own joy, then that's your choice. Can it be both and allowing? So again, it's just looking deeper at that. I don't care if you eat that cake or not. <laughs> Mm. it's your energy towards you doing it. Like if you're like, I shouldn't eat this, but I want it. Then that can still be like, again, that could still have you feeling like the guilt and regret that I think can make more toxic feelings than just the cake itself. But when you're like, yeah, I want this cake. It's okay for me to choose this cake. I want this cake today. And that doesn't mean you're going to choose it every day. And so sure. I don't know what's going to happen to your love handles or love side, <laughs> side body. But for me personally, I have noticed, like I used to be like, 
people say you can eat what you, whatever you want in this. And of course my body has gone in fluctuations, but when I used to be so, I shouldn't have this, or this is bad, I would do this. And when I would allow myself those little indulgences, I feel like I hung on to weight more than when I was just like, yeah, I mostly eat healthy and these things, and I want to enjoy this and I'm allowed that. So it was like an interesting thing that I think that our energy around the food can have us holding on to more of the weight. Okay, beautiful. I've just got a few more. Yeah, I think that was a bit long, go, a long one. <laughs> after we go through a few, it's going to kind of all come together so we can apply it to any situation. Okay, so this is a real situation I was talking to with a friend of mine who was in this situation. Um, he said something to the effect of, I should go to my aunt's funeral, but the plane tickets are expensive. Yeah. So looking at that, and I love, like, I do talk about the book too, they sort of like things that feel like they're obligations, but like you also kind of want to. So I should go to my grandmother's funeral. So looking at again, like, why do you feel that you want to go to your grandmother's funeral? Is it just, well, that's what you do when someone dies. The whole family is going to be there. I really want to show my support, but I can't really afford the ticket, but I could, but it's going to set me back a little bit. So like, that's a very realistic one because it's not just even making the choice of going, but the money Mm -hmm. is. So yeah, but you're first getting clear that I do, it sounds like I do want to go. That person does want to go. It's not just a should. So the choice, so it really then is I want to go. So it also then switches the energy from I should go to my grandmother's funeral, but I can't Mm -hmm. afford the ticket to, you did see why you want to go. So it's not a should, it's I want to go to my grandmother's funeral but the price is more expensive. And just, did you notice an energy shift from the, I should go to, I want to go, then you more like, no, I really want this. So -hmm. then it has you looking at it differently. And when that, when I feel like I've gotten to my choice on what I want, it helps me get clearer. So the money thing is still an issue, but because you've seen it's a want and not a should, you can get more proactive in, could I ask my family to chip in? Do I have any miles? Can I, do I know any Mm -hmm. miles that I could ask? Is there anything I can do? When you have gotten yourself to the want choice, you can allow yourself to see more possibilities and get more creative about like, yeah, that ticket is still expensive. It didn't change the cost, but you're now clear Mm -hmm. on, I want to go because I want to be there with my family. I want to be there for this time. So for me, when I'm able to shift to that, it makes me then get like, so what, okay, I want this. What can I do about it? And it's not just one choice of buying the $900 ticket or whatever. Right. So you stop putting all your energy on, on the shame around it, about around possibly not being able to do it. Instead, you, you funnel it into creative solutions to make it happen. Okay. And perfect. even just when you're talking to the people that are related to it too, like, then you are saying, I want to go, I just can't afford the ticket, you know, like, and so there could be, then you actually can't afford the ticket and it doesn't happen but you've gotten, I wanted to go because I wanted to be there with my family and that can't happen. Cause it'd also be like, oh, I want to go, but I'm across the world on a, you know, I can't actually get there, but you've gotten clear. You want to be there. So then why did I want to be there with my family? So what else can I do? You know what? I'm going to make sure I'm going to like send this note to be read aloud or something. So you can also get more creative on what was the attention, the reason you wanted to be there. And if you can't do that actual one thing, What's another way you can express the reason you wanted to You can to shoot there? a video. You could hire somebody to go and Zoom it. You can do all kinds of stuff that you probably wouldn't think about if you were focusing on the shame around it. Yeah. And like, you know that you tried. It was a want. I still want my intention of I'm there with my family mm-hmm. to be there. And but just might look a different way. Okay. Okay. How about this one? I should take the dog out for a walk, but I should also finish this email. So that's looking at priorities and like, so, okay, I want to take this dog out for this dog, this, so even I want to take the dog out for the walk, the dog needs to go out and take a walk. And I want to finish this email. So what is the, you know, like bigger priority? If the email is going to take like 30 minutes, is it just, yeah, okay then finish the email. Cause also it could be, you're just dilly dallying on the email. Like I should do this and I should, oh gosh, I'm not finishing this email. Cause I should do that. If you just go these, this is a reality. <laughs> I have an email. I have a dog to walk, finish the email. <laughs> I want to finish this email so I can go walk my dog or mm-hmm. wait, no, the bigger priority is like my dog's about to have an accident. They haven't been outside for eight hours. I want to go walk my dog and I'm going to use that time on the walk to get clear on what I'm trying to say in this email. (laughs) Okay. All right. Last one. 
I should sign up for a dating app, but I hate dating apps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I recently signed up for a dating app and I forget to go on the dating app. And I'm like, oh, right. Why am I on this thing? <laughs> um, so I should sign up for a dating app. So again, that could just be like, why do you want to sign up for a dating app? I want to be in a relationship. I want to have a family. I want to have kids, whatever. Got it. So that's in the answer. You've gotten your answer. I want to be in a relationship. And so then again, you can see even the choice, then why not try this thing? And I'm going to show Mm -hmm. up again with not that energy of a, this is what I have to do. Cause this is, I guess Mm -hmm. what you do these days that if you're date, you should be on a dating app. Mm -hmm. So you get to choose it. I see every should as a choice. I should be on this dating app. Cause that's how, you know, I should be dating. Then all right, that's the reality of the world. So, all right, I want to be on this dating app because I want to try. I want to see if it could work for me. It makes me put it more in my control and again, make it like more fun instead of like, so resentful that this is the only way that you can do this. Then that's also your choice. If you don't want to get on the dating app, but that's the idea, then what else can I do? All right, every Saturday afternoon, I'm going to go out to a place I want to be and I'm going to force myself to say hi to at least two people. I get it. Now it all makes sense. (laughs) So you're basically saying that should exposes your pessimism, your natural pessimism. Want helps you to channel your optimism, your natural optimism. So stay more optimistic than pessimistic and you'll end up attracting the experiences that you ultimately want to have and not attracting like sitting on your hands and just waiting for it to happen, but inspiring yourself to take the the desired action that is in alignment with those experiences that you want to attract into your life. Yeah. And that's what I say in the book. It's like, it's not like living your dream life. It's like you're living an aligned and alive life because you are constantly aware of what you're doing and why. And I'm not, oh, date, this is the only one I can, way I can date. So I should be on this app. And you're resentful while you're on the app. So like big surprise, if you don't meet anybody when that's, I'm so don't like that this energy, is the way yeah. I should be. And then you're mm-hmm. seeing, cause me too. I'm like, all right, why did I do on the app? Right, I should be messaging people on the app because that was the idea, <laughs> Trisha, of why you joined the app. And I'll be like, maybe I'll just delete that. Okay, delete that. But wait, why did you join? Right, because you thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice to go out and have fun with people? So right, why do I want to be on it? So when I show up, it's right, this is fun energy. Like, why not? I could try it out like that. So it's really, again, it's making like, why I'm saying I focus on that word. It's not like I even say it's like, my kids will tell me like should is a bad word in our house, <laughs> but it's not like really, it's more that I use the word should as like a yield sign. Hey, mm-hmm. what's going on here? What are you doing? What is your choice? And again, it might be to be reframing and you change the same choice or it's like, yeah, I don't want that. You don't, nobody's forcing you to join the dating app, but if you do want to date, then make a different choice. So if I'm not going to put my energy into the dating app, then what am I going to do? Like I said, then I and you, make this other commitment to myself. <laughs> and you obviously don't recommend people become the should police. So I'm sure you've had that experience, right? <laughs> How do you inspire your partner, your kids, not to, not to excessively use the word should? Yeah, no. And I definitely have my moments of going of, of again, this has been a long time. I've been on this path. <laughs> so I've had my yeah. moments of you've being annoyed the all police. of your friends. They're <laughs> None of nobody's surprised you wrote this book, right? <laughs> but they won't read it. They're just like, just don't say the word around Trisha so that she doesn't correct you. Oh, I'm like, right. No, Somebody <laughs> says the word at, at Thanksgiving and everyone looks to see <laughs> what you're going to say. <laughs> and so I go through phases of not like, obviously now with the book out more, but no. So I oftentimes, especially if people say it, what will happen is, you know, like if someone I notice will like, I'm so present to it and so present to it. And people don't even know they said it. So I'll be in a conversation if somebody keeps using the word, especially if it's about something I can tell that they're sort of like struggling with, not an, like we're just talking here, but I will sometimes be like, Hey, did you, did you notice how many times you said the word should? And be like, no, what do you mean? Um, so I sometimes, like I said, if I can see that it's showing up in somebody's language in a way where it is like, I don't know what I should do about this. And I should do this, but so-and-so says I should do this. Like if they're actually like really trying to get to something, then I would be like, well, what if you tried it? Like, look at it this way. You've been noticing this, but yeah, like 
you know, in general conversation with like, Hey, we should go to dinner tomorrow. Like that people were saying to me all the time. I'm not to everybody. No, we will go to dinner because we want to, <laughs> <laughs> but I will, but you know, so, um, cause it's also, and I do in the book, I was like, if people really commit to this, like I do, it's not always a one switch. There's different things. And so there even is a chapter of, of different ways to get around it when you are talking to people, because it's like, I'm saying like, it's not fun to should on yourself and, but it's also not fun for someone to should at you. So to be like, this is the way it is. This is what you should be. No, you shouldn't say should even, but like to look at your language when you're talking it to other people. But it's also a lot of the book too, is having self-compassion for yourself. And like, this stuff is not your fault. The fact that you're shooting on yourself, the doubts, the fears, the shame, the guilt, this is all part of us as humans experience. So to allow yourself to look at it with more love and compassion and not, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm still struggling with this. Or I can't believe I just had that judgment. So I, I think we end up you know, piling these heavy emotions on top of heavy emotions already. And we don't end up healing it because we're making ourselves wrong for even feeling the way we do. And so seeing that doesn't feel good for ourselves and that doesn't feel good for other people to also receive from you. So yes, you love them. You might know better than them. And also it's not going to come across and like, you should be doing this or you shouldn't be using the word should. <laughs> um, you grew up in Ohio, right? Yeah, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. <clears throat> so Catholic schools, all girls, high school. Right. Right. And and your parents were together um, as you guys were growing up. So talk a little bit about the Midwestern mentality that you grew up with. Like what was before we get into like what you end up doing as an adult, I want to, I want to, if possible, hone in. To, onto where that came from, if there were any indications from a, as a young person, like, were there any ideologies? I know your mom was a nurse. Was your dad like, you should work for yourself or you should be creative? Or was there anything, any philosophies that you, you grew up with hearing your parents echo? Hmm, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's mid, if it was Midwestern mentality or what. There was definitely like, it felt, you know, this sort of, I felt like this, like the idea of like the fitting in with their, like keeping up with, you know, like I grew up really like looking back pretty what, like we lived in a good size house. We had a pool, we had a big yard. I went to mm -hmm. yeah private Catholic. I mean, I went to Catholic schools because that was my mom was raised Catholic and she went to Catholic schools. And so all the cousins did, but like, realistically we had everything. Like, I don't, you know, it's not like I was asking for everything, but we had so much, but it really, I felt like we were poor. Like I felt like constantly not enough, not like, you know, like there's not enough. No, no, no. Like just such a focus on money, which is interesting. Cause like I said, I'm like, wait, I had like Nike shoes. I had the things, but why did it just feel like not enough? Um, yeah, my mom was a nurse. My dad, when I was growing up, he worked for like the major bank of um, like a major bank change, but I think he was like the head of basically, I think like maybe maintenance, but he wasn't like cleaning man, but you know, like would go around to different branches to be like uh, fixing things or whatever. Um, and he did that for a good amount of time and it was a solid job. And then he wanted to branch out and do something on his own. So we got into something where it was like, you had your own tool company, like you sold tools or something. It's like you, it was sort of like you, you were working independently as an entrepreneur, but not because it was like, this is a company where it's like, here, work for yourself and buy these tools, tools from us and then go around and sell them to other people or something. And it didn't work out. <laughs> and then he bought like a, a neon sign company. Remember the big arrow signs, you know, that there lots of, they'd be at stores or people could even get them for birthday party and customize. Like he later like bought like that to again, be like working for himself. And like, yeah, that like, you know, it, it, he got by. Um, and, and there was a long time of him being unemployed too. So my mom, uh, I, especially as we were older was the main provider. Um, but yeah, my dad definitely, I feel like had this spirit of sort of, Hey, why not try things? And my mom very much like, Nope, we, you know, like got to keep making money, stay on this path. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. 
And there was conflict. <laughs> Were you uh, into music back in those days as a young person? Yeah, so I always loved music. And you know, that might've been something from my dad. I remember him taking us to concerts as a kid. Like I went to Tina Turner as like maybe eight years old, just because like he, like he would want to go to concerts and he needed somebody to go with. <laughs> so I was like, I went to lots of concerts as a kid, uh, like just going with my dad or then like the whole family and stuff. So that's must be, and I remember we always had music playing, like had a stereo other things. So I really got into music and that was something I always connected with. Um, I mean, and, and then live music did become a thing to me and ended up, that was my first career was becoming a live um, sound engineer. And I really loved music so much that when I was a teenager and going to concerts, I didn't care what the music was. I just like, oh, you're going to a concert? Can I come? And I really just was there and like paying attention to the music and not like dancing and having fun, but like really just like listening. Okay, so talk about the um, the, sh the shower experience you had when you were 15 and how that, where did that, where did that come from? And, and how did it, um, how did it lead you to start leaning into your intuition? Yeah. So feeling that, you know, there was, my parents didn't, you know, they had a lot of differences and they didn't really get along. I had, you know, wished they separated when I was in about fourth grade. And I honestly like had wished they had continued with that and gotten divorced. They were not happy. Um, again, being raised uh, Catholic and going to all Catholic schools, uh, I just realized early on, like I was very questioning of what is, and these are the rules and this is what you believe. And this is, you know, cause it says it in this Bible. So that's the truth. Like I remember even from a young age, like always questioning that just sort of like seeing a lot and being like, this doesn't really make sense. Or like, why am I supposed to listen to my parents when they're obviously not happy? You know, like it just, I remember from an early age being like, like what, I don't, what are we doing here? <laughs> Especially feeling that in the teenage years. And I also had a lot of undiagnosed pain. I went to, my mom did take me to all sorts of doctors. Um, later I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia when I think that they first decided to give that a word or something. But so I was on a lot of physical pain uh, and that had me not able to sleep. And so I did stay up a lot at night and would think about ending my life because I just felt really alone and like nobody really understood me or saw me. And my family was there for me again. Like, yeah, it was kind of probably annoying that I was sick a lot. They had their own stuff going on. Uh, I had friends. I was invited to the parties. I could have been, I was probably like considered a cool kid. I went to an all girls Catholic school. So again, there was like, it wasn't the same clicks <laughs> at schools, but that, but I had all that, but I just really, I don't know. I just really felt like this, like, what are we doing? And this, like really trying to figure out how to fit in and stand out at the same time. And so like, I really just had this moment and it was because I had, I was going to be forced to sit and eat, um, a meal with my parents and my grandmother. That's what caused the meltdown. I had really been isolating myself that like came home from school, go to my room. Like I really just like lived in my room at that point. If I wasn't out with my friends that, so what caused this shower moment meltdown that was pivotal for my life was that I was going to have to go eat dinner at a table with my parents and my grandmother. Um, and so I just was like, I had this moment that I was like, if you think about ending your life all the time, it's either like take that choice or what if there's another way? Uh, and again, it's funny, you were saying this a lot in my podcast yesterday, but like looking back, same, I'm like, I didn't have the language, but like what I now looking back, it's like realizing I couldn't do anything about the physical pain that was happening in my body, but I could do something about the emotional pain that I was causing myself. And I think a lot of us still live in and that I still have to come overcome every day, which is like really putting so much attention on like, what does everybody else think about me? What should I be saying? What should I be doing? What should I wear? Is it cool if I do this or not this? Like really like we're putting so much weight all the time in these tiny decisions that's reflected more on what is everybody else gonna think about me? And so it was just like, all right, if you really think about ending your life all the time, what if it's just like, what if you tried life a different way? 
And what if it was just that paying more attention to what I thought, what my opinion was, what felt right to me, then what should I be doing? <laughs> what, what's the best? What's, what is the cool thing to do? Like, what's that? And so I really started to live my life that way. And, but yeah, I had, it was like, I, I really like kind of had a psychotic break, to be honest, where I was like drawing on the mirror with red lipstick. Okay. I was making this choice. I made the choice to live. I made the choice. This is it. I'm done thinking about like, it was sort of like, I really never thought about ending my life ever again after that moment. It was like, I chose to live. And so that I ended up turning the shower on as hot as it could go. I don't know. Like, again, not only made sense, but that's just like what happened. And it was like, I was just in that shower, like burning red skin, sobbing for a really long time. And when I came out, it was just sort of like, okay, this is, this is your life now. You're choosing it. And I still... You live that way and it's still a moment to moment choice. It's not as if that shower water never made me care ever again about anybody else was thinking, but it really is this constant coming back to, whoa, what's going on here? Like, are you judging yourself? Are you comparing yourself? You're really like afraid to wear that outfit outside right now because you're afraid people are going to judge you for it. Like, but what do you think? So this constant coming back to myself. So um, there's a lot of, I think, awareness now around you know, anxious thoughts and, you know, mental health stuff. And how, how are you able at 15 years old to discern between your anxiety and your intuition, that intuitive voice? How did you know this is my intuition, not that? Yeah. And I mean, I definitely didn't know it wasn't like, oh, this is anxiety and this is intuition. I mean, I think looking back, I still wouldn't even be able to identify it as those things. It was just me getting more about what do I, again, it was more just like my opinion. Hey, you have an opinion. This is your life. Like, again, it was mostly these small things. Like, do I raise my hand or not? What does that mean about me? Is it good to be smart or not? Like, so these tiny moments of questioning myself. And so allowing that questioning instead of what is everybody else going to think about me? Or like, well, what do you want? Do you actually like really want to raise your hand and say something or no? Like, so I don't know how I had that awareness and I didn't, wasn't able to name anything. It was just trying to ask myself if nobody else cared, if nobody else mattered, what would you be doing? If nobody was watching that, it just realized how much I was unconsciously defaulting to everyone else. Do you remember where you, you first saw that question? Uh, did, did you read it in a book? Did you hear somebody say it in a movie? Like, if it didn't matter, you know, what, if it, no one was watching you, what would you be doing? Or did you just kind of cognize that on your own? So that was cognized on my own. And like I said, it wasn't the language I'm giving it now, maybe wasn't that. It was just sort of like, you're really thinking about ending your life. Like, why not just, you know, try not caring so much about these other, about other people? Um, reading those sorts of quotes and stuff though would have probably came in like college. I, I did, uh, I moved, you know, I said like the one thing I did for my parents is what I went to get a college degree, but I was very interested in music. Like I said, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I really wanted to be part of live music, but I didn't know what that was. And so I ended up at Columbia college, Chicago and like music business was the program I found. Um, but while I was there, I discovered, and, and I wasn't a music pro program that was even music business, but it was a lot of like guys that were like, well, you don't even know anything about music. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about engineering music. I just know I liked it. <laughs> so I really like didn't know much. And so I really felt this lot of like, what are you even doing? You don't know what you're talking about, whatever, like really felt like again, this judgment and we just had to be like, right, but I'm interested. Okay. So this is why I'm doing like reminding myself again, why I'm doing this. But during that time, I discovered this quote from Eleanor Roosevelt that's still my favorite to the fact that both of my daughters have the middle name Rose to represent this quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, which is, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And that was such a game changer to me that when I discovered it back then, because I was really being met with a lot of external judgment, not just the fear of being judged of like, you don't know what you're doing. What are you doing here, girl? Like, blah, blah, blah. This. And then that later took into, I did find like, oh, there's a sound program. And I started working my way at, started working at House of Blue Chicago, selling shirts, 
because they had just concerts upstairs, got to know the production people and then was like, hey, I think that's what I want to do. And they're like, oh, come hang out. I created my own free internship for I was showing up full time for three months because that's what I wanted to do. And I knew nothing. And I was in the way. I was so like the people like took me in, but also was judged constantly by people. And I just had to keep reminding myself no one can make me feel inferior without my consent. And it wasn't even, I know what I'm doing because I didn't, but it was just like, why am I here? Because I'm drawn to this because I want to. So even that they can't make me feel like I don't belong because this is what I want. And so I'm going to keep showing up and learning and proving it to myself. So I think like those early college years is where I did like that quote was discovered. And I think it was like lots of others quotes. So like the, the, the thing that I sort of referenced before, I really started to get into like, wow, like it's amazing how one sentence that someone else has said can really change your life. (laughs) Mm. And next thing you know, you're on the Today Show, you're on the, you're on Letterman, you're working in your dream Behind the scenes, yeah. (laughs) Behind the scenes, yeah. (laughs) Not as a, yeah. But yeah, so I, I did, I committed to, I wanted to do live sound. I didn't even know what it was called. I got a job working at the company store selling t-shirts because they had concerts. I said, hey, I want to do that. They said, come hang out. I then quit another job that I had so I could be there from like load in time because I was just getting there for sound check and I wanted to see it all. I was, it was, I worked for three months before they finally paid me on New Year's Eve because to be another stagehand because they needed someone like, and I really just kept showing up and it was a lot of hard work and a lot of people again being like, what are you doing? Cause there were not many girls, young girls. Um, and yeah, I got, ended up getting hired by a sound company of San Diego Brian Wilson came through on a tour and his sound engineer like was so rattled. He didn't have his regular people there. And he was impressed by me and was like, if you ever want a job, let me know. I was about to graduate college. Hey, and they just gave me a job. I ended up touring like right away. And yeah, like the first shows I was working with Mary Chapin Carpenter, who was already a Grammy award winning artist. (laughs) I was like, okay, you're going to be at the Today Show and Letterman this week. And, you know, staying at like, I got like car service and like staying at these fancy hotels and I was like 23 (laughs) and yeah, like I made it happen. And it was this constantly like living by that. No one can make me feel and feel inferior without my consent, but it didn't, but also like constantly being open to learning and doing better and not like, I know better than you, but just like, I can't let their judgments affect how I feel about myself and what it is that I feel like I am called to do. Were there any, you have any stories of any screw ups from the early days that make you cringe still when you think about them when you, when you were working in sound? There's many, I mean, I think for sure. And it's a story that I referenced in the book that I got like the, a, what felt like the biggest opportunity of my life. I got hired to work for Dolly Parton and like even got flown to Nashville for the afternoon for her to uh, meet me at her studio so that she could just talk to me to see if she felt comfortable, I guess, or confident with me being controlling her sound. Cause I was the monitor engineer. So I controlled what everybody on stage heard. So every single person on stage has their own mix that allows them to perform. So if they can't hear themselves well, or the background singers, the kick drum, whatever it is, then they're not performing well. So it's super high pressure job. So I'm mixing from anywhere from one to like 14 people at the same time, a different mix for each person. <laughs> it's insane. Um, <laughs> I'm now even like, what was, how did I do that? Um, so I was, I got high, I was 25 and they asked me to tour with Dolly Parton. Like, and I was like, what? So nervous. Yeah. I got flown to Nashville just for the afternoon to like have a conversation with her and then like back to the airport and I got chosen, but I was so nervous and so scared that I really screwed that tour up. (laughs) Like it was interesting because it was like by them hiring me, it meant, oh, this, she knows what she's doing. Trish is a great sound engineer. Uh, She can handle this. And I was, but I also like being hired to work for someone that big, that young, then I just like, I doubted myself so much. I went along with things that didn't make sense or were right because I was afraid to speak up. It's just, yeah, it was, it got real messy. <laughs> and I finally had to be like, well, I'm so afraid to mess this up that I, I was just frozen in fear. And that by me, like actually acknowledging that 
in like being like, Hey, and I even did, I like said to everybody, I know that I have not been doing the best job in these first couple of weeks. And I, you know, like there's a lot of things that need to change. And so like, I wasn't speaking up things that weren't right. And, but by me bringing attention to what I was so afraid of and my self doubts, and I was able to move through those and change things and finally like own up to, yeah, I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't handling this right. Cause I was so afraid of messing up, but I wasn't trusting myself. It was, it's just such an interesting thing. So for me, I realized that it, it feels like it's easier to ignore our fears and like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm scared. It's fine. It's fine. But like they hired me for a reason, like that sort of thing was helpful, but I needed to even look deeper at the fears and that when I can look at my fears and then question them and just see like, yeah, that's a valid fear. You're working for an icon. It's a valid fear. And so what are you going to do to like support yourself through it? Instead of like, I was just trying to ignore the fears and it made it worse that I was just like frozen and kept messing up because I didn't want to face how I felt. What does it take to be a a, a really good sound engineer? (laughs) Like, is there a natural ability or skill that you can, you can see if someone has it or not, or things that you have to learn on that job? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of like technical parts of like moving pieces in the gear that you're using for me, for being a monitor engineer, um, and taking care of that many artists at once. It's interesting because, uh, again, there are very few females, but I realized it was like, it's a very motherly position because I had to like really check in with people and be present with them. Um, how are you doing? Are you okay? And I also had to learn that sometimes people, so one of the issues on that tour, it wasn't all my fault is that people didn't come to me to say like that they didn't like their mix because then they, so they would just like tell, you know, someone higher up, like Trisha's not doing a good job instead of saying, I can't really hear well. So it's like they, you know, like making their job hard, like it's, and that, that will happen. Like people be unhappy with their guitar tech. He's not tuning the guitar tech, right. But instead of actually telling the person that does it, tell like the higher up that you got to fire that person. They're not good. Like, but not just saying, Oh, you're not doing it right. So the ability to really like read people and to be like, are you sure? And like giving them that it's a lot of presence and attention and being to, able to manage many things at once. Yeah. I imagine there's also I mean, uh, the reason why people do that is they want to avoid conflict, direct conflict with you. They don't know you that well. They don't know if you're going to take it personally. So yeah. So they tell the the intermediary. Um, so I, another skill would be not personalizing things when you get that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and that's too, like when I was so frozen in that fear, I was so afraid of getting bad feedback. Then I wasn't really checking in with people. It was sort of like, I bet that I bet this, I bet this doesn't sound very good for them, but I was afraid of getting that feedback. So I wasn't really checking in with them how I normally would. It was like, it was such a big gig that it made me have so much pressure on myself. And I stopped doing all of the things that had made me be good at my job. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. The classic overthinking, making you make mistakes. But if I had like checked in with them, that it probably would have been gotten fixed earlier. But I was like, I can't face the fact that it might not be good enough. (laughs) So I'm just going to keep digging a hole for myself. (laughs) But you're professional. You got good at it. Did you see this as being something you were going to do for, you know, indefinitely when you were in your mid twenties? Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. I don't know if I ever thought about it as forever. Cause I also had always dreamed to be a mom and that's obviously not a lifestyle. I mean, people do, especially if you're an artist, you can tour and be a mom and you bring your kids on tour and nannies, but like being part of the crew. Yeah. It doesn't make so much sense to be a mom and leave your kids for months at a time, because it was like my entire life was dedicated to these, like, you know, whoever I was working with. So I don't, feel like I ever just saw it, but I was, it was the only thing I wanted to do. And I hadn't seen past it. There did get to be a time and that tour was a big shakeup for me too. Like I ended up, once I ended up recovering, I did actually end up quitting the tour. There was a bunch of other reasons and drama that was happening behind the scenes also, but I sort of like got myself through it. And then also was like, this isn't worth it. Cause there also was a big part of it too, that I had thought that once I get on a big tour, that means I've made it. And so Mm -hmm. that's the goal, right? You want to be on the biggest tours that are playing the biggest venues because that means that you've made it as the sound engineer. And I realized I didn't like it. I rathered being with the smaller 
like family like tours where everybody felt like family that there's a lot of drama and stuff in these big big tours and people trying to be the person's person and stuff like that so that was actually a huge thing for me like oh I don't want like this idea of success I think right it's like what success looked like to me was getting the biggest gig and the biggest name but it actually wasn't a great environment for me. I'm not saying all big tours are like that and that, but it was, and it, and it wasn't to Dolly's, it wasn't Dolly and her bands. It wasn't Dolly's stuff, but um, there was just like the drama of that. But yeah, so I, it really had me reevaluating again. Like, yeah, what am I craving if I don't want to be on the biggest tours? If I realized, no, I'd rather be on the tours where people feel like family. Um and then I did tour for several years after that, was able to get on tours that felt like that was still like, I ended up touring with Natalie Cole for a while, another icon. And that was like, oh, okay, this is a smaller like family thing. And there was a part of me that knew I was ready for something different, but I didn't know what that was. Um, what was, was your, what was your takeaway from working with those big artists? Like when you got to see behind the veil, of their lifestyle, did you have any insights or epiphanies about how what it means to be super successful or what it doesn't mean to be super successful? Yeah, it was really eye opening, and like of course the fact of, huh, these are still humans and they feel like they like you think like you're like I was living my biggest dream that I worked so hard to make happen as the sound engineer touring the world these people were really living their biggest dreams. It was their own music, fans, you know, private jets, could buy the same shoes over and over and forget about it. And it was no big deal. And they even see, seeing people that had like supportive loved ones and relationships. So not even seeing like, of course, there's people with toxic families and relationships too, but I was <laughs> seeing really good stuff and like, wow, their lives are really hard and they're actually unhappy a lot. Like you think once you have it all, everything's good. And it actually looked more stressful, <laughs> harder, a lot more going on. And they still had the doubts, fears, judgment, comparisons, so many requests coming at them constantly, not being good at boundaries, I would witness and think, I, I didn't know what the term boundaries back then, but now looking back, like looking at it. So also just seeing like that, wow. And that was something back at House of Blue Chicago that I wasn't able to see in that level of success, but we would have such a variety of artists come through and it's so different. So it'd be like, you know, here is a Wu-Tang clan. And then tomorrow is the, and then the morning it's the Sunday gospel church. And now, um, the doors are coming for a five day stay with Pearl Jam opening. And then it's, uh, I don't like insane clown, pop, like every, the, every type of act in the world was coming through there, like in one week at the time I worked there, it was really hot and seeing that all these different types of people and all the lovers of success. And like, wow, it was just interesting to notice how they were and just how they even like seemed if they seemed happy or not. And like, that it didn't really have anything to do with their level of fame and success. Um, so like really working in that industry really showed me like the humanness that we all struggle with. And that once you get everything, that doesn't mean everything's easy peasy. So mm -hmm. I had had that realization, but I had, it was just like, information. Oh, interesting. Wow. Cool. Well, I'm loving my life. <laughs> um, and what happened then my, my father passed away suddenly and it shook me up more than I would ever expect anything to, um, you tell the story of the day you got that call and, and, and how it all went down. Would you yes. Mind? So I was, uh, I was about to go on tour to start for like a, basically like a year and a half long tour. And it was starting in Australia and I'd never been to Australia. So I was super excited. I was supposed to leave on a red eye that night. And I like, okay, I got my stuff packed. I'm going to go to yoga class and I'm going to do this. I had to stop at the bank to get money to bring for the tour out. They were depositing to my money to give to the like tour manager in Australia. Anyway, I had like my stuff to do. I went to yoga and I got out of class and there was messages from my sister and she had called to say that our dad had been found dead in his car. And I, I definitely went into complete shock because I also was like, well, I have to go to the bank to get the money out for the tour. So I'm playing like was like driving, like still going to the bank, calling the manager of the artist I was working mm -hmm. for to like my dad's dead. But like, I think I'm going to still go on tour. I don't know. <laughs> anyway it was like so like such a shock I definitely went into like 
just like business mode. Um, I did fly home for the funeral, but I did still go on that tour. I just didn't know what else to do. And also like, I think that is what most people like, yeah, you just go back to work. My work just happened to be that I was going to a different country. Um, so, but that it just changed my life in so many ways. And one way is that I really had never let myself, um, really show emotion. When, I think from that moment when I was 15 too, I had turned really into like, I'm strong. I am independent. I don't need anybody was also part of that, like choosing life that was in there. And so because of that, I realized like I had a really hard time letting myself cry at my dad's funeral, even like I, I had a hard time, like letting people see me feel things. Um, and I'm not getting emotional right now talking about it. And, and that was like really like a big moment there that like, I felt like I needed to cry. It wouldn't come out. Everybody else left. And I still was just like, I need to cry. Like I was like having a conversation with my head, like your dad died, you're allowed to cry, but like fighting, like knowing that it had to come out. And I finally let it come out. And it was like the most disgusting animal sound crying, but that set off something in me too, that I was like, I'm not I'm no longer bottling up my emotions or trying to hold them back or not allowing myself to feel things and see that. So I stuck with that too. Luckily I had gigantic sunglasses at the time because then I went on tour and like the entire flight there, I was probably crying, got there, was so happy to see this like tour family would be during the shows on the side of the stage doing sound, sobbing. <laughs> Like, it was just like, I don't know. And Laura sort of just telling myself, feel like emotion is present. Cause it would be like, why am I crying? This doesn't make sense. You know, like I'm like, I'm fine. And just sort of like allowing myself since that moment to like, just sort of be like, okay, you're feeling something like, just let it go. Um, but so it went on for like a couple of weeks and I finally was like, all right, I, I can't do this anymore. I also was still on tour, traveling around the world. And I was a mess, but I also sort of had a, this new lease on life. And I would see, why does everybody else look miserable? Like, it was interesting to me to notice that wherever I was walking past people on the streets, it seemed like more people people were unhappy than happy. And, and this is also before, like, really, we had iPhones. So it wasn't like the distraction of that, just like, just that. And I just wanted to shake people and be like, you could die tomorrow. Like you really could. And we say that all the time. You can get hit by a bus tomorrow. But my dad's death was he, what had happened, what they think happened is that he slipped on some ice and hit his head and then passed out and died of hypothermia. So it was mm. like, you really don't know. He was 58. He was healthy. Like you don't know what could happen. And so that really did just like, I was pissed off at people. Like, again, going back to like that moment at 15 and just, there's a lot of light in life that isn't fair. And so I'm not saying there's not a reason to be unhappy for anybody in that, but I just wanted to shake people, like physically shape them to be like, is it really so bad? Or are you making things like worse than they need to be? Are you worried too much about things that don't matter? And also, even if life is really hard for you right now, like you don't know, it could be over tomorrow. Like, could you find, like do anything right now to kind of boost your mood to like have some joy, not like ignore what's happening. But I just, um, so that really got to me and I ended up just giving, stopping. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do sound. I'm never doing sound again. I could have said, I'm having a really hard time. I'll rejoin the summer tour. Like, can I'll get somebody to fill in for me for the next month? I was like, I'm never doing sound. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I need to do something more with my life. <laughs> and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> So did you, did you have, prior to your dad dying, did you have any sort of spiritual foundation aside from going to a Catholic school <sighs> as a young person? Um, did you believe in destiny, fate, reincarnation? Like, how did you reconcile that, that happening that seemed rather spontaneous? And then he's, you know, dies alone of hypothermia and discovered a day later. Yeah. I mean, I, and I wouldn't describe myself as Catholic, like I said, even even in elementary school, I was like questioning that, but mm -hmm. I, um, I do feel very spiritual and even, you know, 
when I like talk about getting into those quotes, like in early like college years and stuff too, that, yeah, I was definitely always looking for information and feeling like I took my health in my own hands also from the fibromyalgia. They gave me a bunch of pills and stuff and we're just like, good luck. I'm sure these days they maybe do more for people. I don't know, but the pills messed me up more. So I got into like, okay, how can I eat to feel better? What can I do to support myself and feel better? And that also was noticing doing things that brought me joy, being with people that I didn't enjoy with people who drained me and made me feel my pain more. Like, so I was really aware of my body and how I felt and realized when I was in certain situations with certain people, if I felt more enlivened or not. So like, if you think about it too, like I have fibromyalgia and I was working like 18 hour days for a lot of that time, but it was because it was something that was fulfilling to me. I didn't really feel the pain, but you know, like I realized when I would get jobs that weren't aligned, even in high school, I would really feel terrible. So I was always really present to how I felt. And so then mm-hmm. looking in food and stuff, um, I stumbled into a yoga class during that time when I was working at House of Blue Chicago and still going to college. Um, and uh, it was just for exercise, like, oh, look, okay, they're doing this. Let me see if I want to join this for exercise. And I was lucky that the first yoga class I ever took that was at a gym, I loved. And the teacher was like incredible for what I needed. And from that first moment on, I was like, oh, this, this, like it would just open something different to me. I also, during that college time, it was a liberal arts school. So our like gen ed classes were different. And so I had taken like a philosophy of love class and it was it was more about like self-love and the teacher had us go through like the narcissistic aspects of our parents. Like it really had us evaluating uh, like these things that I would never, like, I think I took philosophy of love to like find like love, like my love, someone who would love me like to be. And I was like, Oh, it's about like learning about that. So like, yeah, like, so the, that really helped shape me and honest, like to my dad talking about my dad, we had to write papers for these class, right. And like go through the um, narcissistic aspects of my parents or trying to go through like why we thought they were the way they were and why they raised us the way we were. And that was when it like the floppy drive, my dad like took my old floppy drives cause he needed them. And he found all my papers <laughs> on them. And my parents did end up getting divorced when I was in college. Finally. And I'm the youngest. They waited until I was gone anyway. And he found these papers and then drove to Chicago for one day from Cincinnati. Cause he was like, I just need to see you. I found this. And he like sat me down and told me, opened up to me about like his entire life and some about like my mom and how she had grown up, but like really was telling me why. Some, Cause also I wasn't hugged as a child or told, I love you for a long time. And even saying this, that seems weird, but so I think that was part of it. So he like came up and found the stuff. And so he like saw it and really wanted to tell me about his life and why these things that had shaped him and had shaped my mom and had shaped their relationship and then how things that, how they had raised us. Mm -hmm. So how that got to that, to that is that I remember my dad coming up to have this conversation. I didn't remember, I I didn't really like to be talked to my parents, had the meltdown moment. (laughs) <laughs> when I was 15. So that was a real breakthrough moment. So my dad and I, after that moment became very close from him opening up to me, but he came and I was like, this is amazing, dad. Thank you. I have to get to yoga. <laughs> like I had just started taking this gym yoga class, like a couple, like a couple, like a month ahead of time. And I was like, this is great, but I like have to make it to this yoga class because like, I, I just like really like need it. <laughs> But I had forgotten about that moment of him. I don't, I haven't really talked about that. So anyway, yeah, I was like spiritual, but not like really. And I really, I did yoga was something that I ended up really, really into during that summer when my dad um, passed away. I was like, well, I have no idea what I'm doing. This is, I might as well get certified as a yoga teacher because I I'm home now. That was also the first time I'd been in one, in one place for a length of time. Um, And so, yeah, I was like always into sort of my own sort of spirituality and like understanding things, but um, sort of like personal development-esque, but not, Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I ended up getting certified as a yoga teacher. 
When did you go nomadic? I know you went to India at some point. Where was that in the timeline? Was it after you quit your job or? Well, so a lot. So I honestly, so when I started touring, I realized how funny it was to come home from a tour with like a suitcase overflowing of stuff and backpack of stuff. And I'd be gone for months at a time, be like packing up the tour bus and be like, oh, I have so much stuff. And then would, you know, fly home to a, a closet full of stuff and a house full of stuff. So after my like first tour, the next year when I went, went out on a tour again, I did get rid of almost everything. And I didn't have places to live for a lot of the time. So I would go out on tour and then it's like, okay, you have November off. I'm going to go to Costa Rica for November. Okay. Like, you know, oh, okay. Can I stay at your house? And like, you would just land at other people's places and sort of for a little while. But so I would be, it would, I lived a lot of life like that, but it was most of the year would be like on tour. And then for the chunks of months that I didn't have tours, I would just go wherever I wanted and do what I wanted. <laughs> or like I said, be like, oh, okay, let me stay at this person's place in LA for a couple of weeks and then come here and come back. So traveling was always part of it. And India came up later when I was like, I, again, I felt like I was living my dream life and then, but also felt like I wanted to run away from it. So I ended up, I got you know, t- certified as a yoga teacher that summer after I quit the tour. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I wanted to wake people up and I was done with sound. And that where, is when I decided to give up the word should too. And it made no sense to me because I didn't think I lived a life of shoulds. Like I, I lived a life of my wants. I had done all of these things and I had made them happen. I was living my life. So I don't know where that idea came from, but I was like, okay, I'm done with the word should. And I committed to it so strongly that if it tried to come out of my mouth, I would stop. I would be like, what should, and I would be stuck. Cause I was like, what, what other word do I use? I also was just like, I can't believe I use this word all the time. I, d- I don't understand. Like I didn't know when I was giving up the word should how much I used it. And so I kept getting stuck on it. And I was like, if I really am going to do this, I need to find another word to replace it. And so I tried out different words and the word want is what felt like the best to me. And so then I was constantly coming back to what do I want? Do you want to say something? Yeah. What prompted you to even think about that? To even think about giving up the word should like what, what, what happened just before <laughs> were you, were you saying that to yourself? Were you journaling or something? And you were like, wait a minute, I didn't use this word a lot. No. So that's what I can't figure out. So the, like being on tour, I can't deal anymore. I need to get off this tour. Cause I'm so emotional and a mess. And I just feel like I need to do more. Um, I know I actually like, so I left the tour. I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I'd always want to, I went to Thailand like for a month actually there. And I was just like escaping. I do remember I bought a bunch of books before I went to Thailand. I went to a yoga retreat. I went to some cleanse. I did all sorts of like things, but I don't know. I'm like, I wonder if someone at that yoga retreat mentioned something to me about the word should or something, because I don't, it wasn't like, oh, I went, this person said it to me or I read a book or something. It must've come from somewhere. And I don't know where I keep trying to figure it out. Like it wasn't this thing I can pin down, but I remember coming back to California after, you know, like running away to Thailand and then be like, okay, so what am I doing now for the rest of my life? And so I just was like, I'm done with the word should. So I don't know. I really wish I could tell you (laughs) where it came from. It was likely, I mean, I don't know if it came from thin air or if it was just like casually mentioned, you know, by someone, it wasn't like a, this is it. It came from this, you know, thing that I did or saw. Um, But yeah, I really stuck with it and it showed me so much. And I mean, that's what ends up my book that just came out is about is like, that was in 2008 that I gave the word up and I have stuck with it ever since. So I still come up against shoulds every day. I don't say the word, but I can feel the energy of it in my body. It can switch to it. But just, I was real. I realized how much the shoulds are so deeply embedded us that nobody, you know, again, people are like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I live a life of that I want, but it really just got me so tuned in that I'm constantly in, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I doing? And why from this one word? I want, I'm trying to get to the India story, but anyway, so also from that, 
I didn't know what I was going to do. So I'm also asking myself, what do I want all year long and doing these different things and doing the yoga certification and stuff. I ended up creating a new role for myself going back on tour and they called me a joyologist. So I just kept, that was the world I knew was that I was touring with artists and I saw how unhealthy the environment is, how exhausting it is, how when these people who are the stars or in anybody in a business, the position of power, nobody questions them. And so if they're in a bad mood, then everybody's walking on tiptoe that I just like, you know, and also just seeing like, there's so much going on. And also nobody's really like taking care of these people, uh, in a real way, <laughs> like you everything good, good, you good. So anyway, so it seems like you started working with these people as your clients, but that was the world I knew. So I knew what I wanted to do and create a role where I was taking care of the artists and other people on the tour, but primarily the artists so that they were grounded and healthy in body and mind. And so I brought the Yoda certification out. I bought, brought my love of like eating, healing foods back on the road. I made you know, other food for them. I would write affirmations on the mirrors and on the stage. So that when, cause again, you think like these people are awesome. They still get flustered. They hit the wrong note or whatever. They see somebody and then get a doubt. So like every night down at the bottom of the stage where their monitors were, where they, <laughs> what they would use to hear what I used to control was now an affirmation from Trisha that was like, you're enough, or you got this, or, you know, like whatever different things but I also then was sort of the person that was like hey what's going on like I noticed you know like you seem upset so wh wh what's going on okay what are you going to do about it and like all right or like okay you're really stressed out right now why you don't love doing all of these interviews okay how can we you know like do you realize you can actually speak up and say like, maybe, you know, create a boundary with interviews. Like I can only do press from these hours or I only do this. Can you also see why that those interviews are helpful for you and why they are a part? So like they're seeing that they're living their dream has now become a job. So how could they actually enjoy the life that they created and be integrity with who they were and who they wanted to be? And Jason Mraz, who was one of the people I toured with later called me his manager of integrity. <laughs> But so I created this amazing job for myself and I loved it. Um, did that pay well, that job? Was it, did it pay the same as your engineering job, your sound engineering job? So when I start, because I am someone who I just want to do something to do it. So to start, no, I just sort of like had to get myself out there. But then it had ended up, yes, eventually nice. I made, when I would end up, you know, it, it also, again, like first I just wanted to do it and then a negotiating you would negotiate weekly is how usually that work worked. Like what's your weekly rate. And so mm -hmm. negotiating that. And then eventually I was, you know, negotiating a contract with benefits and was sort of, and even was like, if you decide you no longer need me, then I still get a year sal like a year salary. That's amazing. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> because did you know someone else who did that? Who created no. a position? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> And that doesn't mean that I never doubted myself or think, what are you doing? Nobody's going to say yes. I, again, like all that stuff comes out and that judgment and people being like, you're what? And people making fun of me, even being on these tours and then be like, yeah, Trish is the blah, blah, blah. And they roll their eye, you know, like, I still feel like a lot of those people like roll their eyes at me. And you were like I'm a like, punchline for a little bit of, of the first, the early days, right? Oh yeah. And that's what I'm like. I still am wondering. I think some of those people are like, you read a book. You were just a smoothie girl. Like, that's how they were like, you know, like, cause that's what, cause I would like, oh, here, you want some smoothie manager label person while you're out? Like I would be like offering these things. Um, so yeah, that's how some people saw me. And I had to, again, be like, no one can make me feel inferior without my consent. Like, yeah, a lot of people don't understand, but the person who is running this whole tour, that's paying all of their salaries <laughs> enjoys me on tour and I'm making their life better. So it's like, it doesn't matter what all these other people think or saying out about me or what they think I do and don't do or whatever the thing is. Um, so yeah, like, <laughs> so no, I made up a job. <laughs> you just need one person to say yes. <laughs> And that's the thing I always remind myself. You only need one person to say yes. It might take a while. Um, but yeah, so no, but so yeah, like, but then I, again, 
when I was working, I working, that was even working more closely with someone. And even though it was something I loved to do and it really lifted me up and my job was like keeping them healthy. So I was really living a healthy lifestyle and taking the best care of myself, but also again, it's exact, ex- exhausting and draining. So at the end of one tour cycle, I was like, okay, great. I did that. What's next? Like, I sort of was like, I don't know if I want to continue doing this forever. So I was ready for like a break. I don't need to go find another tour just to like keep touring. Like I was like, huh, okay, let me take some break. And I'd gotten into blogging at the time. So I was like, I think I'm, I'm going to write when this tour is over, I'm giving everything up and I'm going to go to India. And I seriously like gave almost everything away. You can get a since six month visa. So I got a six month visa by everyone. I'm going away to India for six months and who knows when I'll be back. Cause I'll just probably keep going. Um, did all that went away. Like, you know, like the, a tour ended probably in mid December. And I think the first week of January was my flight. And the day, like the day before I was about to leave a friend threw a party for me. And this guy was like, so what are you most excited for in India? And I was like, I'm so excited to not be around anyone I know. And it just came out of my mouth. And I was like, what, what? Like, <laughs> And I said, I went to India, but I was like, that's such so interesting that I said that. And while I was there, I realized like, I did want to be in India and I was happy to be there, but I really was just running away from my life. And I gave up everything, gave up all my belongings, went to the other side of the world so that I wouldn't have to like say no to people and their invitations. Like, I just knew that I needed my time and to recharge. And I wanted to be able to do things my way without anybody else's opinion or, Hey, what are you doing, Trisha? Or, Hey, do you want to do this? And I didn't know, like, I didn't see all that until after the fact, but it was just easier for me to flee my entire life than to be okay doing simply what I wanted to do. And sort of like that year when I was grieving my dad, I went through that, but that made sense. Like she's grieving. So it's okay. Like she doesn't want to do anything. And she's like isolated. Like she's like doing this thing, but it felt like I was no, like, Oh, I wasn't going to be allowed to do that again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wasn't going to just be allowed to do whatever I wanted and not care about other people and whatever, and going to support them and doing things. So were you blogging about should at that time? And, and, and what, what's the anatomy of a should, like, what are we really talking about when you say should literally no shoulds in your, in your, com- in your language, or is it only about specific kinds of situations? No, I really, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm sure I, I mean, I know I've been talking about the should thing for a really long time. So I'm sure there were some blogs. My blogs were very much like, just like noticing things throughout my day. Like, oh, I was unhappy about this. And then I realized this, or I don't know, that was like, just like writing about my experiences and how I like had an aha that day about something. But I mean, I'm sure there were some really early ones about that. I mean, there are blogs from at least 10 years ago from me (laughs) writing about this. But yeah, so I so committed to not using the word and I still don't. Again, only if I'm like giving you an example of like, we should do this or, oh, I'm feeling and I should this. So even when I'm reading my kids' books to them, if it says should, I change it for a different word. I It was such a powerful shift for me that blew my mind that I never wanted to lose it. <laughs> Because it gave me such self-awareness that I have been concerned if I just start to like use it or it's no big deal. If I say it this way, will it just slip back? And then I will lose this awareness and mindfulness that I have that's related to it. So that is why I have been so firm in it. But yeah, the book isn't just like in the whole mission of it is like just F the shoulds and do whatever you want all the time. And so you don't have any responsibilities or obligations to people it's really for me, I'm getting clear on what I'm doing and why. So again, I face shoulds all day long, right? Like I got home from my kid's graduation. It's like, uh, I don't really feel like working, but I should work while the kids are out of town, like aren't in the house and it's still like a work day. So, okay. So it's like being aware of this should energy. I should work. Why do I feel I should work? Because the kids are out and it's a Friday and you work Monday through Friday and then looking at that, like, okay, is there something that actually has to get done? Is there like that? No, like I actually ended up, I was planning on getting to work after the graduation today and before our call. And I didn't, I relaxed. 
but I felt like I should work. And then I got con com confronted with like that. No, I actually really feel like I'm tired. It's a Friday. If I want to catch up on work tomorrow, I actually don't have the kids tomorrow. So I could do that. But like, I'm actually good. You know what? I think I'm going to allow myself to rest. But of course, most days it's even like, oh, okay, just drop the kids off. Okay. I should be getting to work. I'm not working yet. Right. So why do I want to answer the emails or why do I want to do that thing that's on my like, you know, list today? You know, so looking at why I want to do the thing and then, oh, good. And sometimes it's just because, because it's something that needs to get done. <laughs> and if yeah. I keep putting it off, it's going to keep weighing on me. So for me, the big questions that help me move through like shoulds, because that's what I'll get people ask, like, well, what are the good shoulds or the shoulds you should do? And I'm like, well, no, I'm constantly reframing and seeing that everything is my choice. And so I'm looking at it. And so sometimes that is like, oh, I should really clean the house. Why do I want to clean the house? When the house is clean, I feel so much better. Things are put away. Or is it I should clean the house because I feel like a lazy, messy person and I'm not allowed, you know? So it's really looking at in what my priorities are. Sometimes I leave the house a mess because I would rather spend time with my kids and be present with them, or I would rather rest and I'll get to that later. And I don't have this shame or this is what I, you know, like whatever about it. So mm -hmm. getting at what is the actual story here? that I'm telling myself. And then it's like, yeah, I should clean my house because it, I, I feel better when it's, when it's clean. How do, like, so why do I want to do it? And how will I feel? And then like motivate myself to be like, okay, turn on a timer for five minutes and let's like do that. You know, the whole process of writing the book every day. Okay. <laughs> you should be writing. <laughs> right. So it's like, I'm still confronted with them. Well, why do I want to do the writing? Cause I'm really actually, you know, I have a deadline it's due so that I, I actually like want to be there, but also I really do want this book to come out into the world. I really believe in what I'm sharing. So it gets mm -hmm. me to do the thing. I should really exercise. Why? Because when I exercise, I feel more present, alive, less stressed, less like anxious. Oh, right. So I want to exercise. So it's sometimes just reframing it to look at why you even feel like that thing is weighing on you. And it, like a lot of times it's inner judgments. Oh, I should be doing this. Oh, why do I want that? Is it just because that's what I've been taught to believe I should be doing? I should look like. So it just really has me constantly facing all of this stuff that we're so busy. It's going so fast that we don't look at and like, wait, this isn't even, do I really think that? wait, I work for myself. I don't have to work Monday through Friday, nine to five. <laughs> like, <laughs> Do you feel like men and women treat that work the same way? I don't know. That's a good question. I have no <laughs> idea. I make up and I, with no idea that probably more women uh, suffer more shoulds. <laughs> That's what I, I feel intuitively. Um, but I, I think it still could apply to, you know, I think everybody does that. I should work out. I should work on my passion project. I should do this. I should do that. Okay. So within, let's say it's, it's mostly women that are affected by that word. Are there certain women that are more affected? Is it like a mental health thing or is it, is it a societal pressure thing? Like what is the genesis of this shame around the word should well, I think it's definitely a societal pressure. Or the feeling pressure. tone of the show. Right. I think it's definitely societal pressure and media. And I mean, I think that's even why it's more put at women's because there is more focus on what a woman should look like, what a woman mm -hmm. should be doing with her life. We should be married by this age. We should have kids. Like you should be a stay-at-home mom. No, you shouldn't do this. Like there is so much, like the world has decided way much more than what, like way much more, like really, like when I'm saying all that stuff, yeah, like why do we not, why is there less pressure on, well, how come you don't have kids? How come you're not married yet? And I'm sure men do get that pressure, but it's so yeah. much different for women or what our bodies should look like. Like there's what we should be talking about, what we shouldn't, like there's so much more projected at women of us trying to fit into these boxes that were made up. So we don't even realize that again, as, as much as I was living a life of my wants, still all of this inner conflict and inner judgment of myself based on what I'm taking in constantly 
that I like, I still, you know, as much as I've been using this non should that stuff as so, such as I've been living my life a certain way that it's still so deeply ingrained in me, like my body image stuff that like every mm-hmm. day I have to tell myself, yes, you are allowed to wear that Trisha. Even if your arms are not as thin as that person's, even if you don't have this flat stomach, even if you're not this size, like it's so deep that every day I still have to walk myself through. And it it just happens so quick. Look in the mirror. (gasps) That's my arm. Oh no. What does that mean about me? Like, it's just insane how deeply rooted it is. Um, F the shoulds do the wants came out in, uh, in May. And is this your first, this is your first book, right? Yes. So I think you and I have the same agent, correct? Yes. So talk about that process. Like, okay. So, Cause and I want to, I want to just kind of wrap up with this, but you know, there's somebody else out there listening to this and goes, I've been thinking the same thing about would or could or whatever word they've been thinking of. And maybe they've been blogging about it. How do you go from just, okay, I have this, this obsession with not using the word should to, I have a book called F the shoulds do the wants. Like what, how, how does that work? Yeah, good did you question. put together your treatment and send it out to a bunch of agents or how did that, how did you land that? Well, I, from, like I said, when I started blogging almost like over 10 years ago now, I, I was just like journaling for myself and I loved mm-hmm. it. And I was just sort of like, wow, this feels so great to like write my experiences out. And I didn't expect it to go anywhere, but people did really resonate with, and it was like me telling my story and then, and look at how you could do this sort of thing. And that always felt really good. And, you know, and I don't, I've never had like huge social media following, but like back on Twitter, like I I had that experience of people resonating with my words. And so that really made me want to continue to share them. And so I, for like over 10 years was saying I was going to write a book. Like when I was going to India, I was like, I'll go there and I'll write my book and that. So I kept telling myself I was going to write a book, but I really was waiting for someone to choose me. (laughs) I was waiting for an agent, for a publisher to be like, here is your book deal. We can tell you have things to say. And that didn't happen. I think that does happen to people. That does happen. It did not happen to me. (laughs) And so I finally was just like, I kept, you know, like, I know that I have so much to say and share inside of me. And a lot of these things are things that I've said over and over and over again in videos and podcasts in client calls and coaching groups and everything. Um, and so it kind of was getting annoying to repeat the same things over and over one. It was just like, no. And also, um, so anyway, I was like, all right, this is time you need to sit down and write the book. Um, and, uh, I honestly wasn't going to write about this because I've been talking about it for so long, but people, it don't, it it has always felt like it seems too small and insignificant that you just focus on one word that, oh yeah, yeah, no shoulds. Yeah. F yeah. F the shoulds don't show yourself. And that they would still use the word like consistently over and over again. And even people bigger than me, you know, with bigger platforms would be like promoting this don't shit all over yourself and, you know, getting all this attention. And then the next post would be like, we should do this. And I was like, but they don't get it. You're constantly shooting on yourself and other people by using the word. And so again, like just getting annoyed. Um, but I was going to write about something else. Well, one of the chapters in the book, which is really like this way that we're constantly judging ourselves and that the fear of judgment is really us judging ourselves. And it just so happened that somebody I was about to interview for my podcast, we were having a conversation and she kept using the word should. And it was somebody I did like sort of know. So I was just like, I did have a moment of like, hey, I don't know if you've noticed, but like you use the word should constantly. And like, I think that'll be my second book. Like I said, like, you know, I do this thing where I don't use the word, I change it. And me just telling her about it in a couple minutes, my idea, she was like, you need to write that book. What? That's life-changing. And it was like, yeah, why am I not writing this book that I've been talking about for years? And so then I just had to sit my butt down (laughs) and commit to it as so it finally just took to like yeah this is the thing uh i can't wait for someone to choose me and then but making that time of putting a lot on pause without knowing what would come from it and like you know you don't like 
and okay, but I'm committed to, I really want this to be out in the world. Like even just having one person remind me of, yes, wow. I want to know more about that. Like convinced me to sit down and to keep going and going and going. Cause yeah, I was lucky. I was introduced to our Colleen, our mutual agent by someone early on. And, uh, actually a year before that I had talked to her and she was sort of like, well, do you have an idea? And I was like, no, she's like, we'll get back to you when you have an idea. Like, and I was like, no, don't you have ideas for me? <laughs> like, look at my stuff. Tell me what to write. Like I wanted even her. And I was just like, I was pissed off when I finished that first conversation with her. And then like a year later, someone else introduced me to her again. <laughs> and I was like, here's my idea. Here's my proposal. And I had, it was a very terribly written proposal. Um, but she was like, your proposal needs a lot of work, but I, I see something here. I do think you're onto something. And so, um, yeah, so then it took a lot of time of rewriting it and getting really clear. And the first two, the first sample chapters were straight memoir, which I think I needed to write to be able to like heal myself more. Um, but yeah, a lot of work and just this commitment and also just, yeah, like I have to sit my butt down. No one is going to like clear my schedule for me and tell me, here you go. It's your time to write the book. We've got your, we've got your mission statement here for you. <laughs> That's so funny. That was exactly my experience as well <laughs> with my first book. And I don't think people appreciate that. You, you have to actually do the work. Like you have to commit to it. There's no one's going to give you permission to do whatever your dream or your passion project is. You're never going to get permission to do it. You're just going to have to give yourself permission. And, and you're just going to have to do it. So you're going to have to keep want showing it. up. Yeah. You got to keep, keep showing, showing up. up when you don't know what's going to come from it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what's my should score? Did I use it at all during this interview? I didn't catch it. <laughs> I don't remember using it. But I don't, you know, I don't, you're, I didn't you're the one it. that's like, yeah, no, uh, that's, that's interesting that you asked me because no, I normally will really catch it. And I have had people that are interviewing me for the book and even telling me, oh my gosh, yeah, I was reading the book and I was noticing <laughs> I this, love and they're it. like, right. they're telling me ahas and that they're still constantly using it. And I didn't, sometimes it depends. Like sometimes I point it out and sometimes I don't, but I don't think you did. Cause I don't remember, I will get the sort of like, like I'm so present to it that my body's sort of like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, awesome. I'm, I'm so happy that we got a chance to uh, to have this conversation after having our previous conversation where you were interviewing me. And uh, I love I love the idea of being mindful in your communication and watching how you use that word. But more than that, just noticing the energy that you feel around using that word and uh, and, and, and then mindfully choosing a different way to express yourself in order to have the type of energy that you ultimately want to have. And you want to, you know, we all want to lead by example, especially if you have kids and things like that. You want to make sure that they're not picking up your, your habits of pessimism and you, and that they're able to, uh, to become more uh, optimistic just because that's the energy that you're putting out there. So thank you very much for, for doing this work and for carrying this, this load so long since 2008. Oh my God. That's crazy. That's insane. It's like, it's like what, 14 years you've been, you've been on the should, on the should. There campaign. are some very, like I was saying, like, I remember when the, do you remember the daily love? Yeah, of course. With I Matt, think like with Kip, Mast, uh, Kip, Mast and Kip, Matt, yeah. Mast and Kip. I was, I was a writer for that. I'm, I'm sure I wrote about the shoulds back there. And, and that was, mm -hmm. yeah, like at least like 12 years. <laughs> awesome. 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 And uh, obviously the book is now available. So um, you can get it everywhere books are sold. And you also have, you have a pretty resource rich presence um, online. And so is there anything else that you, you want people to explore um, as an entry point to your work outside of the book? Oh, good question. And thank you for the conversation. And I think, um, I think you got some things I don't, haven't really talked about out in our conversation too, which <laughs> you mentioned for my conversation with you. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. fun. Um, and yeah, like I said, I just want to say one last time, like it is, I'm paying so much attention to the word should, but like, once you really pay attention, it's more like, it's not about the word. It's, it's about you and what mm -hmm. you're doing and what you're like seeing that things are your choice. You're not going mm -hmm. through your life feeling like resentful and guilty or shame and all stuff that you're really clear on what you're doing, what you're feeling and why. So for more about me, yes, 
definitely get the book. F the shoulds, do the wants. Um, I, I have a daily inspiration app, Own Your Awesome, that has hundreds of mantras and affirmations that you can come to. I do have a product line and one of my favorite items is this daily connection journal that has, again, these daily prompts. I have the pot, my podcast is called Claim It. And yeah, I'm, I'm out there sharing on all the things in social media and TikTok and doing my thing. You can either find me at underscore Trisha Huffman and my brand is still your joyologist from I, for years, I didn't even use my name. I just went as your joyologist from being given that name on tour all those years ago. <laughs> you still get uh, requests to come on tour with whoever artists to be the joyologist of the tour and that kind of thing. Is that a thing or people like, are there other people who are now joyologists who followed your, your, your lead? I don't think like anyone has totally taken the role I did, but yeah, there's much more these days on tours of different, you know, like it's, I think it's a lot more common now to like, I back then it'd be like, Oh, what your personal trainers on tour, that person has their nutritionist. And that's why it was like, you know, like those were more like actual roles, but that also just seeing that allowed me to, you know, create that role. So I do think there's a lot more different support. No one really took that. And, um, I don't have most of the people. So that is also the part of my work too, that I feel good about that. Like I like Jason Mraz, one of those, one of my main clients and I still like work with him, but I don't tour with him because again, he mostly from having me at his side for years has now been able to internalize it. So it's like the mm. manager of integrity is now able to more live in his brain than mm. outside of it with me. And so like, you know, still having that. So, and that's what I wanted is like, I don't, I want people like to do the work on their own and stuff. So I do still work with people in the public eye and artists and stuff, but as a mama, it's more like, oh, wait, I can work with people like FaceTime and text and Zoom <laughs> and not be with them 24. I mean, being with people 24 seven obviously makes it much more effective because they can't get away with anything. They couldn't okay. escape me. <laughs> Right. They couldn't escape me, so I would make them confront them with their own shit. Um, yeah, so I still work with people, but in a much more, um, yeah, I've created my own again. You have to keep recreating what works for yourself and in that work-wise as well. So, well, last question. Now that you have this book out, right, this is sort of like your your personal manifesto around this word should. What now? Like, what, what's the next thing you're going to lock in on? Good question. I do... Uh, I still feel like, you know, that pull from years ago where I just knew like when I felt like, oh, I'm a writer. Okay. So I do know for sure I plan on writing more books and putting out, you know, like I said, I'd already created products. So I'm excited to create more. Like I have my own affirmation deck that I self publish, but like creating more products and different styles of books that, you know, like even like you did the 108, like, like just using all of this stuff that I'm like, I have so much to say and putting it out in different formats. So I do plan on putting more out and yeah, I want to get more into like public speaking and yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to keep on. This is not like I did my book. I'm done. I really <laughs> felt like, all right, I, I love this. <laughs> I have more to say more to come. I loved Beautiful. that process as challenging Beautiful. as it was. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And I look forward to hopefully meeting you at some point soon. And, uh, and until then, thank you for, for showing up and, uh, and for living your purpose and your passion and taking the leaps of faith and believing in yourself and all the other good things that needed to happen in order for us to be having this conversation. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.